trauma-informed services to survivor students of sexual violence. And I wanted to let everyone know that we are recording this session. So, and we'll have it logged on, on our blog afterwards. So you can download it um, in order to use it as a training tool, hopefully in the future. Can everyone hear me? I'm not seeing any response in the chatter box. Okay. Yay, thanks Ashley, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> People are out there, yay. Um, so we're gonna have a pretty interactive day um, for this web conference. We're gonna do some chat, we're going to do some polling options, and I just wanted to quickly talk about the technology. Uh, you can raise your hand in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. You'll see a My Status, and you can raise your hand to be having a moment to inter intervene if you want to say something. We are calling in to the phone line. The phone line is up in the top of the chat, um, the number. And we'll also be doing polling. So there'll be a couple times where we ask you to participate by polling, and then we'll share the results with you for that. We'll also be closed captioning for this webinar, so you should have that technology available. And as I mentioned, we're recording and we'll have this available for response. One of the reasons we really want to be recorded is we just became aware last week of Stay at Home September 26, 2016 campaign to show solidarity for uh, the Terrence Crutcher and other police misconduct and uh, police brutality and Black Lives Matter movement. If you're not sure, uh, if you haven't heard about this movement, today is a call to uh, for no work, no school, no shopping for 24 hours to show the impact of African American voice in the United States. And we at CalCasa really respect this and will be showing our solidarity following this conference. If you want to learn more, um, Liliana is going to put the hashtags into the chat box, um, and this should be going live and viral uh, today and starting some important conversation. So today we're going to do a brief landscape um, of Title IX, the Clery Act, and California law in regards to response to and prevention of sexual assault. We also want to identify some simple tenets of trauma-informed and resiliency-focused schools. And what we want to do is elevate it beyond just your trauma-informed response to a trauma-informed system. We're going to share some best practices, and we really want to connect you guys to each other. And I'm giving a little bit of feedback, so if everyone can just star six their lines, that would be great. So how we got here, um, we really got here on the stories of survivors. Uh, we've witnessed uh, raising awareness around sexual assault in the past years, and we're seeing more federal regulations and things like Title IX that have been around since 1972 suddenly have new life and fertility. And they're able to, um, we're able to use those laws to really look at those issues of safety and discrimination. From, from my standpoint, I see the lay of the land kind of like an island. We have Title IX as these large hills and very important um, discrimination context. We have the Clery Act which is more of a front lines and around a safety defense. And then, uh, and then there's the California state law, which is more complex. And, <laughs> and often confusing. Title IX, I picked some images just to remind us what Title IX does. Title IX is really focused on sex discrimination and the letter to colleagues um, from the White House about four or five years ago stated that 
sex that sexual violence is a form of sexual harassment, which is a form of sex discrimination. So some of our main takeaways from Title IX is it applies K through 12 and our colleges. It has a right of action, so students can sue under Title IX. And sexual assault is discrimination, is, sex, is a form of sex discrimination. That's how Title IX applies. I also just want to highlight that people labeled responsible persons on campus are responsible for Title IX reporting. The Clery Act, I see it as around more safety as the primary focus. This came out of a sexual assault rape. Um, and okay. and was about improving campus safety. In the past, in VAWA 2013, it has created more, um, more laws and preventative and protocol requirements for campuses. Um, the college-specific safety considerations are, you know, really where Clary comes alive for campuses. There's an annual reporting mechanism too, and if you're not involved in campuses as regularly, um, this is often called the ASR, Annual Security Report, and campuses have to load that up on their websites and disseminate it. There's a security focus. We know through timely warnings and emergency situations, and there's a focus on violent crime. And under Clery, the campus security authorities, those that are deemed CSAs, are required to report under Clery. And then California state law. So California state law feels very eclectic to me. It is a bunch of different interpretations of the federal laws and it makes specific requirements for California. One of the main things that I'm sure you're all aware of is California has an affirmative consent standard for campus investigation. So it's moving from a yes, from a no means no to a yes means yes standard. Also, sexual assault and DV counselor privilege still applies in California law, so that, that privilege is still carved out. Um, and there's required MOUs with law enforcement and encouraged MOUs with rape crisis centers and CBOs. I also just want to highlight that state law is a rapidly changing landscape. We see legislation each year that um, changes and fine tunes and sometimes complicates our, our state laws. Great, so our first polling question before we go into the meat of this webinar, which is around trauma-informed practices. How many of you have been trained on trauma-informed practices to responses for sexual assault? So if you can see that polling piece up in your corner and respond yes, no, I don't know. All right. Good, I'm gonna share the results. So we have about 60% of you have already been exposed to the idea of trauma-informed response, and 13 haven't. So that means there's some of you that maybe didn't respond, but <laughs> that's fun too. Um, I just wanted to have an idea as we move through this next page, how much detail you need as a community. So again, we kind of have talked, you guys have a good working knowledge, 60% of you anyway, have a working knowledge of trauma-informed. But we're going to push you to consider, is your system trauma-informed? So being a trauma-informed system is really about embodying a trauma-informed response through all levels of your work. A trauma-informed program realizes the impact of trauma and identifies paths of recovery for everyone. It recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma. It integrates knowledge about the impact of trauma on the policies, procedures, and practices of the entire system. It actively seeks to resist re-traumatization, and it centers resiliency for those impacted by trauma.
And we know trauma has impacts. Um, quickly, just show of hands, if you could raise your hand if you work with uh, trauma survivors, either sexual assault or other forms of trauma survivors. Right, you guys are alive out there, great. Uh, we, at least, you know, six, 15, 16 of you are working with trauma survivors directly. And trauma impacts everyone, especially when we think about the, the prevalence of sexual abuse, that one in four women and one in six men have experienced sexual abuse. We know that trauma is in all of our classrooms, it's in our communities and our families until we can eradicate this form of violence. And we need to adjust and realize that trauma shows up differently for different folks. Here's my impact of trauma slide. I love visuals and I love connecting it to nature as well. We're really familiar with flight, fright, flight, fight, freeze. And I'm also going to introduce the concept of fawn. So flight is a mechanism of responding to crisis where you flee and you run away. Fight is where you get into a confrontation and you fight back, often physically. Freeze or play dead is where, you know, you're trying to freeze and let the, the crisis pass and then um, escape the crisis by freezing. Then fawn is where you develop codependence. Um, and we see that this has been mostly studied around child sexual abuse, and we see that as a defense mechanism as well. What I wanna highlight is that all of these mechanisms are incre incredibly valuable in a crisis moment. These are the ways that we have evolved to face crisis, and they, they do the job. Running away when you're faced with a, a threat is a way to survive. Fighting and standing your ground is a way to survive too, as is freeze and as is fawn. Think of children that are dependent by nature and vulnerable. This is a way for them to still get their needs met. Um, what the problem is with trauma and the trauma response is it tends to get stuck in the brain. It's, an, it's a reptilian brain response. We don't really have a ton of control over it. And it takes away our logic. So we're not able to think our way out of it. While it works great in a crisis, it has lingering impacts beyond the trauma. So we see this show up as post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so what's uh, important to remember is the very action of uh, trauma can show up in different ways uh, in a non-crisis situation. And if everyone could please star six again, that would be great. The slides will, I'm just checking the, the chat, the slides will be distributed after the webinar and will be posted to our website. On my, yeah. All guests have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Sorry, everyone. I just re muted your lines from headquarters here. Sorry. <laughs> I'm glad, Carrie, you can see the slides. And we'll keep chugging along here. So trauma is, when we talk about trauma, we're not just talking about sexual assault. Sexual assault is definitely a form of trauma. But what's great about these, these principles is they apply for all different forms of trauma. Trauma is a crisis that happens to an individual that requires uh, some sort of response. It's a threat of life. Um, it, it can be, you know, a traumatic impact of a vehicle um, in, a, in a car accident. What we see with sexual assault trauma in particular is that they have, it has long-lasting impacts, whereas some of the one-time traumas of a car accident don't have as long of a life in post-traumatic um, as a post-traumatic reaction. 
but these same principles apply for all. Um, and for sexual assault, they really need to be at the center because of that long impact, that long lasting impact. What we're encouraging is kind of an openness for those working with survivors of trauma. Moving from seeing their behavior as a problem to seeing it as a symptom of trauma. Moving from what's wrong with you to hearing what happened to you and being prepared to ask and listen to those, that story. We're gonna really focus on three areas of trauma-informed tools today. Number one is connection. And this is kind of my be human uh, piece. It's really important to understand the person in front of you and, and, and set up the conditions for empowerment. I'm a big person that believes that empowerment is not given to anyone. It's, it's self-defined and self-created, but we as support persons can create the conditions for a person to thrive and feel empowered. The next one is collaboration. And we're gonna talk about you know, some formal ways of collaborating and also just the need to be an important partner and, and kind of discuss what that looks like for us. And then the final piece is a comprehensive approach. And that really means bringing these trauma-informed practices to your system as a whole and taking care of you as someone that is interacting with survivors of trauma. All right. So our first tenant, um, connection, understanding the survivor. I wanted to, I, I picked, a picture of connect the dots because I, I have small children and we play these games all the time. It's a great way to learn numbers. But it's, what is important for us as working with survivors is recognizing that connecting the dots is what the survivor is doing and how we support them in figuring out their path. Uh, we don't tell them that they have to report to a certain uh, agency. We don't tell them what they need to do as support person. The trauma-informed approach is really about presenting the option. And I really, I, I think it's important for us to think about the myths and stereotypes that we bring into the room when we're sitting across from a survivor. What I'd love you to do is Put into the chat, what are some myths and stereotypes around sexual assault, rape culture you see on your campus, and what are you doing to address these or shift these myths on campus? Uh, so what myths and stereotypes are you seeing, and how can we shift them? Uh, I'm going to have Liliana talk about it. Is it's an alcohol problem, right, Jessica? Anybody seen the old one? Right. Everyone that is assaulted is crying. Sexual assault is only experienced by cis and heterosexual folks. Right. The victims at least somewhat responsible. Excellent. I love that Elizabeth is saying they're, they're training their staff and faculty about sexual harassment that they're perpetrating against the grad students. I'm working in a, in a high school setting. One of our deepest work that I've done in my past is working with the adult staff about how their behavior is modeling harassment. Um, and imbalance of power. And we know that the perpetrator, the person causing harm is most likely someone that someone knows. We know that that myth that, that Dara mentioned is not true. The perp is not usually a stranger. Right. And I think 
what's really interesting for our work here around sexual assault survivors is that the stereotypes are changing and gender definition and identity is changing. Over the last years, couple of years, we're seeing LGBTQ inclusivity. We're seeing a brand new conversation around transgender and cisgender. And we're, we're starting to discover that gender shows up in a continuum. Um, and our systems are going to need to adjust to that. Um, and as is our support mechanisms and our support services. Great, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Liliana to talk about some barriers when seeking services and encourage you guys to add barriers that we may not have listed here in the chat. Hey everyone, um, so some, some of the barriers that we've included in here um, are a few and they're not all, um, but the fear um, of not being believed is one of the most often um, causes of why students might not feel comfortable to re in reporting. Um, and I wanted to share, I'm sorry, before we started going into this, um, Kimberly Crenshaw described that these barriers are being built and strengthened through the imposition of one burden interacting with pre-existing vulnerabilities to create yet another dimension of disempowerment. And so when we're reflecting on these barriers, um, we, sh we should be thinking about how, um, what language we're using to encourage um, and have a safe space for folks to come in and seek these services. Um, another form of a barrier might be a gap in memory. Um, or even knowing the assailant. We see this a lot on the college campuses that the um, assailant is someone they know. And so the fear of being ostracized by their group might be something that is completely um, uh, scary and um, a survivor is not feeling very comfortable um, and safe to come and disclose to anybody about who the assailant is. Of course, we know victim blaming um, plays a huge factor in, in for folks um, reporting and seeking services. Um, there's also a lot of fear of campuses mishandling cases. And so in a study by RAIN, um, there was a study that was done that showed that about 4% um, of students um, reported, but not to police. 9% um, believe police would not or could not do anything to help. 10% um, did not want the perpetrator to get in trouble. 12% believed it was not important enough to report. Um, and 26% believed it was a personal matter. Um, and so it really leads into um, age, alcohol use. Um, a lot of times there's fear, um, the student fears that because alcohol or drugs were involved that they would um, receive uh, additional um, type of punishment or being kicked out of the school. Um, because of um, alcohol and drugs involvement or even blame themselves because they participate in alcohol drinking or, or drug use. Um, and the biggest one that I've seen um, quite often as my time um, in direct services was understanding what occurred with rape. Oftentimes students are not really aware um, of what consent looks like. Um, I, we had very many students talk to us about, well, I didn't say yes, but I also didn't say no. Um, I stood quiet, I didn't say anything, I didn't do anything, I couldn't move. And as Emily talked about it prior, um, th those are all effects of trauma. Um, and so understanding what consent looks like is, a key, is um, something that we should be talking about consistently with our students so that they feel um, and they can recognize that what happened to them was um, rape or sexual violence. And of course, the distrust of, of law enforcement is also a barrier when seeking help. So um, language can also be a barrier um, to seeking help. So um, shifting our lens and, and being um, more trauma-informed by saying option seeking instead of re just reporting options. Um, it's just a reporting option is just one um, piece of that menu that Emily was referring to earlier. There are several um, options in that menu and one of them could be reporting or not reporting. And so when we're sending out um, any information um, to ensure the inclusivity of all folks in, in that as well.
And then we know, um, this is Emily again, that privacy and confidentiality is, is a huge issue. And it was central to the beginnings of the sexual assault and domestic violence movement in the 80s. The feeling is that when people have access to confidential spaces, there's a better development of trust. What we know is that access to confidential advocates advocates that hold privilege that can uphold a privilege against uh, judicial inquiry increases the likelihood the survivor will participate in various investigations and reports. Um, it's, a, it's a way of creating a sound community that actually has the reverse of a chilling effect. It has an effect where a survivor feels supported enough to go through investigations that are often re-traumatizing and re-triggering even with trauma-informed responses. There's, I also just want to hold it up um, that confidential is a bigger net than privileged communication. So confidential is, can be a community practice of keeping things confidential. However, under judicial scrutiny or under an, an order to release, you may not have any legal standing not to disclose information. That's compared to privileged communication. So privileged communication, the holder, in our case, we're talking about the survivor being the holder, but the advocate that is, has access to privileged communications is, uh, has to actively preserve those communications unless the survivor waives those. We can do a whole webinar just on privacy and confidentiality, but I just want to remind you that when a survivor waives privileged communications, it has to be voluntary for a time limit, limited amount of time and an informed release. So we don't want to just do carte blanche waivers of privileged communications. We want to really reserve and preserve that as advocates. If you're an advocate that has privileged communications, you need to take as many means as you can to protect those. Um, and that's what the judge is going to respect when they make, uh, if they try and make a finding about whether the communications should be disclosed or not. State law applies to Cleary, Title IX, and California law, obviously. So the sex, sexual assault and domestic violence counselor privilege can be asserted in and around campuses and within the Cleary Act and Title IX enforcement. So that state law still exists and should be um, supported by the federal law. There's also different forms of privilege. We talk a lot about sexual assault counselor, but there's also attorney client and doctor patient. So depending on your, your licensure, you may have a different level of privilege. It's also important to let survivors know that there are different folks that do have access to privilege, um, to uphold a privileged conversation and communication. All right, let's talk a little bit about the empowerment model because I feel like it's very important for a trauma-informed systems response. Yes, and this is one of my favorite things to talk about, this empowerment model. And we included three little pictures that really um, define what it means to empower folks that are experiencing sexual violence and you're providing that service too. So again, we have that menu of options and choices um, and ensuring that we're asking them. They are the experts of their recovery. And so checking in with them constantly, um, making sure that they are the ones that are making those decisions and that you're not persuading them to, to one decision or another. And also just being that support throughout the entire process. Um, one of the things that we've listed was um, believing the survivor. Um, it, it's so impactful as they're seeking services in, in, in the future with counseling or wherever they decide to go is that that's the one thing that they remember the most is someone believes me. And so if they're coming to you, it, the number one thing to remember is to believe the survivor. And also, just like Emily talked about recently, um, is to inform the limits of confidentiality. Not all folks hold the same privileges or confidentiality. Um, so making sure that your survivor student knows of your limitations. 
um, exploring their feelings and concerns. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in, in a couple of other slides. Um, but making sure that you are meeting them and seeing them and identifying their different identities and their different, um, the different intersectionalities, um, and also having those holistic approaches. Um, providing information um, and, again, providing a menu of options for them. Um, but it, as you are providing this menu of options, it's important also to recognize not to overwhelm them with a, um, a long amount of services. Um, acknowledge them, see where they're at, see what services would, will work best for them, and then provide those um, options for them. Um, and remind them, um, again, that the survivor makes their own decisions and they're the expert of their own lives and road to recovery. Um, and allow for, space, um, allow, allow for space for the survivor. Give them that time to think about what choices or options they feel the most comfortable with. Um, and also, don't place any judgment um, on the road that they take. But empower them and, and support them along whatever decision they, they have chosen. And remember to be a good listener. Um, and that, that listen, those listening skills um, that you acquire will help continue to empower the survivor to um, seek those services or seek those options and seek additional support in their recovery. Great. Um, I think there's ways that we, we build on this empowerment model when we look at our collaboration approach. So another really important part of a trauma-informed um, system is that it is focused on more collaboration, not less. It's focused on opening up the system for a multidisciplinary look um, and holding that up that our challenges can become part of the solution. So if we can address our challenges in um, within a closed system by exposing us to different ideas and different histories, I think we can really move to make campuses more comprehensive in their approach. So I had a question for you guys. How do you show up for your partners? And you don't have to just put it in your work, work context, but any community partners you're, show, you're working with, how do you demonstrate solidarity and support? You could just chat that in a little bit. I'd love to see what you do and how you realize partnership. Great. Showing up at meetings. Absolutely, Elizabeth. Um, and fundraisers, working together. Those are exactly on my list. They provide a contract with the local rape crisis center to provide services. What's wonderful about that is that is a partnership with some, some teeth and meat. Um, when you are funding someone, you have to work through a lot. And it really makes it more sustainable. So you're able to fund the local community work as well as support your survivors on campus. I really encourage you guys to think about ways of going after um, opportunities together. One of my experiences around community building is there's nothing like working on a project together or going after a grant together to build relationships and to identify each other's strengths so we can really approach a project from a strength-based approach. Um, and then also recognizing our distinct advantages and, and differences, where a local rape crisis center may be able to provide resources throughout the lifespan for their survivor. The campus advocate is really great as in accommodating that survivor while they're on campus and making those amazing accommodations. There's also just something about training each other. One of the great ways to show up is to offer to provide training, um, build relationships that way. And identify, you kind of, when you're training an audience, you're getting to know that audience. You're getting to know their interests. And it's a really great way to provide fee-for-service and or free 
um, resources. We're going to talk a little bit about a coordinated community response team. And I'm going to ask you if you have one. So be thinking if you know if you have one or not with the campus you're working with. It's different than a case management team. It's not about individual cases. It's more about looking at the whole system in, and the community and making uh, various adjustments um, based on people's different, different views and experiences. So I'm going to ask you guys, does your campus have, the campus you're working with, whether you're representing the campus or a community or agency, does your campus have a CCRT? All right. We're seeing a it's hovering about 26% say yes, and 9% um, say no, and 9% say I don't know. And I think that is a really fair representation of, of what is occurring. What's wonderful about a CCRT is it really should be part with community-based partners. So that, if it's working, then people do know about it, both on and off of the campus setting. All right, so what is a CCRT? The idea kind of stems from multidisciplinary teams um, in various different contexts. This was really forwarded by the Office of Violence Against Women during their um, campus grants that are ongoing on a national level. And it is about a collaboration to really take a big look at response to and prevention of sexual violence and other forms of gender-based violence. The idea that this multidisciplinary, multi-lens view is more impactful for the community and really gets more at the purpose of um, a system's response. It allows for law enforcement, campus security, counselors, medical and health providers, community agencies, rape crisis centers, legal to come together, uh, and campus admin, to come together to talk about how they are actualizing their response to and prevention of sexual assault. It really goes beyond a crisis response. While the protocols and, and the crisis response is a piece of what they would look at as far as a systems approach, it is more about how are we, in general, being more trauma-informed. We're gonna, we're gonna really see this as a site for actualizing trauma-informed schools and systems because it is about choice, options, and meaningful access to resources. It's also an opportunity to build leadership and partnership. Sitting around a table together, talking about these issues, getting to know each other, um, it's that connection again that's central to a trauma-informed system. Of course, in this case, it's not necessarily with survivors, although survivors and students could be part of a CCRT. Um, but it's really about making connection with other stakeholders that may hold another piece of the puzzle. And when you know that person, you're able to actualize that trauma-informed response when you need it. Say you are on a CCRT, and then you have a, a survivor from campus that needs accommodations on campus. How great is it if you know that person on the, on the campus and can reach out and help your survivor negotiate that um, versus having to go cold or blind into a system to try and advocate? So CCRT is a great opportunity, not the only opportunity, but a great opportunity for a campus and community to come together. It also, what I think is really important for closed systems is to increase your transparency and actualize your communication. So this is, CCRT is a great like PR step too for our campuses. It's a way for them to show that they care about the community that surrounds them. And with campus, students are, students just don't stay on campus. Students are a part of their community as well. So it really, you know, starts to build those relationships and foundations for campuses and communities to grow together. 
It also is a way to communicate. So it builds systematic, trauma-informed communication between various systems, getting law enforcement, medical, admin staff, teachers, students, community organizers, rape crisis centers, domestic violence shelters, and services, homeless um, services together allows you to build a more comprehensive approach. So as you can tell, these trauma-informed tenants build on each other. This is another way to, to be um, a trauma-informed campus is by having this pretty simple um, tool of coordinated community response team, similar to multidisciplinary tools like a SART or a DART that respond to crisis or a child abuse review or death review teams um, in the past, multidisciplinary lens and sharing and collaborating together. So I'm gonna ask a two part chat question. One is if you could chat in who is a part of your CCRT, sorry for the typo on that. Um, and then who do you wish was a part of your CCRT? So if you have, if you're part of that 26% that has a coordinated community response team, um, who's on it and who do you wish, who's missing? All right, great, campus leaders, higher campus leadership, healthcare clinicians, RCC, attorneys, maybe public interest attorneys, student conduct housing, health center. Okay, now who do we wish was on there? I want LGBTQ community activists on there so that everything you're doing goes through that lens. I want social justice advocates, maybe it's so that when you're working with response and accountability, you have a true representation of your, your community, um, your campus community. And that, and, you know, interested to see off-campus partnerships that are listed, they have internal teams and participate with their local SARTs but don't, aren't really bringing in their local crisis centers. Thanks for that, Catherine. I think Part of what we'll talk about next is how do we become that really important partner as a, as a community-based organization or as a subgroup on a campus. Sex offender treatment providers. I think, Joan, thanks for that. I think it adds an, a really important lens. And we're not gonna be able to eradicate these, this violence without consideration of sex offenders and those who cause harm. Other groups to think of are, you know, your Greek, if Greek life is important on your campus. Athlet, athletics, um, any international or cultural centers. Um, being able to connect with um, the Student Affairs Administration and the safety, housing, if ap applicable. And I just add that because for some, some schools, like community-based colleges or you know, two-year institutions, there may not be housing. And I also would encourage, you know, student involvement um, as appropriate. Bringing on students that are experiencing the campus would be a wonderful place for the CCRT. The next place is beyond, uh, beyond a CCRT. What does it really mean to be a necessary partner? And we talked a little bit about how we show up for each other, um, whether we're doing meetings, we do fundraisers, we carve out space to teach each other what we do, but being a necessary part of the system is invaluable. It's gonna, what, it's gonna be what keeps the sustainability going. When there's partnership, you can really see a comprehensive approach in connecting the campus to the community and vice versa. What's important to think about is that closed systems often fail in seeing their impact beyond their walls. 
And what we need to encourage schools and campuses to do is recognize they're, they're not an impermeable wall. They're very porous. Campuses are very open. They have people from the community coming on and coming off the campus and students going off the campus and admin coming off the campus. So we need to you know, recognize that campuses are institutions that are within a, a larger community. And there's also community invo involvement of the campus itself. There's also recognizing what your community, your campus community may need and how the larger community can help fill those needs. For me, being a necessary partner is really about getting to know the system you're trying to partner with and seeing where you can first show up to provide help. So part of that is not always to be not always to show up with criticism, but with an open mind to how we can work together to make the system better. Um, for us in the advocacy world, that has looked differently with different systems. We've now, to some extent, done a really good job in partnering with law enforcement through the development of, of laws and policies and relationship building. What's important for us is to not just partner with one system, but to bring in various different systems to, for a collaborative approach. And being a necessary partner means putting some uh, resources on the line. So what I would encourage is if you're looking to build a relationship with your campus or with your crisis center or with your community-based organization, how can you hold up what they're doing? And how can you bring and, and show that they're, what they're doing has worth and value for your system? That can be monetary, but there's tons of different ways, non-monetary ways as well. Just you know, being able to share information with each other about how you're organizing and how you're responding, inviting them to come in for presentations, and um, making those initial contacts. It's as simple as going out to coffee, and people were talking about it before making that human connection, bring the human and the connection back into your system to make it more communicative and transparent. Then the last um, trauma-informed tenant that we wanted to talk about is what do we mean by this comprehensive approach? And we picked uh, pumpkin pie because I love pumpkin pie. And it's, it's fall, right? So um, what I like about this pumpkin pie, though, is that you can see that the pieces are all from different pies. And a comprehensive approach is really taking a multi-prong, multi-strategy um, view of working on this issue. So comprehensive approach means, for me, as an, as an advocate and a preventionist, how are we incorporating prevention into our work? And how are we incorporating intervention into our prevention work? Because um, it's really important that we don't silo um, in this way. Because we know there's survivors in our prevention workshops, and they may need resources. And then we also know that there's a strong impact on survivors and their surrounding support persons when we do right when we have a comprehensive approach and when that is seen and felt by the survivor. So, you know, I really enjoy pumpkin pie and I enjoy it even more when it's diverse and it has a lot of different ingredients in each of them. I'm going to now have Liliana talk more about it. So what, what does this practice look like, trauma-informed practices, um, it, it, when working specifically with survivors of sexual violence? Um, wait for the narrative to reveal itself. Listen um, to the story of the survivor without any interruptions. Um, it, again, reflects the empowerment model, really using, using those listening skills. Um, acknowledge the impact of the trauma on memory and reflection. Many times, as w when we're working with survivors of sexual violence, they remember bits and pieces of what occurred. Um, so putting those pieces back together can sometimes be very traumatizing for the survivor as they're um, experiencing flashbacks. 
So again, in remembering to give them that space and that opportunity for them to start slowly connecting those dots. Um, be transparent in the communication that you're providing, um, especially with levels um, of privacy. Again, everybody um, holds different confidentiality. Um, and so informing the survivor of, that li of your limits, again, um, in your communication will be really helpful for the survivor as you provide this trauma-informed um, approach. Um, choices, again, um, remi reminding them that they're in control. They're the experts of their, their own recovery and healing process. Um, and remembering prevention. Um, Emily talked about it again, um, is that remembering to connect prevention with intervention and reporting resources. Um, so being aware of trigger warnings, um, sharing the resources and having that comprehensive and multi-pronged approach. Um, and again, culturally meaningful engagement prevention strategy, strategy. So remembering those three C's that we shared with you earlier um, in every practice that you're doing with survivors. I'm just gonna jump in and, and um, define trigger warnings for you although I kind of hate the, the language of it because <laughs> it's kind of violent language. But what it is is really having a simple way. Um, maybe you're showing a provocative piece. Maybe you're showing the hunting grounds or doing some sort of work where you have survivors speaking. It's important to kind of let your audience know that we're going to be talking about sexual violence, and that, and identify resources off the bat. So, and we have some local advocates here, or, you know, if you're, you're feeling uncomfortable, you wanna to talk to someone, please um, come up forward to these folks and have people there that are able to make the connection between the prevention work and the awareness building work you're doing and the intervention and reporting. And it just is really important. Everyone that does prevention work knows that when you go into a room and do a presentation or start talking about this issue, people are going to recognize and connect it to their personal experience. We need to be really prepared for that. And, um, and it's a wonderful opportunity to spread awareness and to improve reporting and to improve our response for survivors. Thank you, Emily. Um, um, I, I feel that we can't really talk about a survivor and being trauma-informed without really talking about intersectionality. So what is intersectionality? It's the interconnected nature of social categorizations of such as race, class, or gender as they apply to, given, to a given individual or group regarded um, as creating an overlapping and interdependent system of discrimination and disadvantages. And so, Remembering the importance of this in the work that you're doing will be a, a key part in providing um, correct and um, services and resources for your survivor, um, student survivor. And why is intersectionality important to violence and prevention advocacy? Um, if we really want to end um, gender-based violence against all people, we must address the complex social inequalities and barriers that leave some students more vulnerable than others. Understanding, um, thinking about the different parts of identities will um, inform what prevention strategies would be more effective on your campus and what the menu of options will look like for each individual student. Um, some examples that we mentioned earlier of intersectional, uh, intersectional identities is race, um, sexual gender, um, age, class, or religion. An example of this would be someone who comes from a highly religious family might put a higher regard on, on virginity, um, which in turn would prevent the student from telling parents of the assault, which then would put them at a disadvantage. Um, why? Because they might not have that support from their family member, whether it's monetary, whether it's believing them. Um, and if they do inform the parent, um, then they may possibly be blamed for the assault. And so we can see that in that specific example, there are different intersectionalities that are occurring someone who is um, a specific religion, a specific race, um, and also a, a specific um, gender identity as well. And so um, as we continue on um, talking about intersectionality um, and how we can incorporate intersectionality in our efforts is really um, kind of a five-step um, 
uh, five-step program that we kind of put in here is really knowing our strengths and challenges and being open to what we don't know, right? And so, again, that we, we come back to that empowerment model of really listening to our survivor student and ensuring that we're seeing them where they're at. Um, two is really challenging um, assumptions and myths. Um, three is seeing the survivor with an intersectional background um, and providing those menu of options and collaborating again with communities and building leadership and power in communities. Um, so again, ensuring that our material, any advertisement that we're sending out it's re is reaching to all identities on our campuses and um, that we're including inclusive language as well. Um, so, again, just going back to that empowerment model and including and, and, and seeing the identity of the survivor as they're telling you the narrative. And then um, we also um, wanted to highlight a little about, um, and this can be a webinar in itself again too, is those marginalized populations. Um, what constitutes a marginalized population and why? Um, students who are isolated because of language or cultural barriers. Um, some colleges, um, most colleges have international students, so there's a cultural barrier in itself there. Um, <clears throat> students who are afraid to report because of fear of um, deportment. So undocumented students um, can be, um, you know, a, risk, a factor to even reporting or seeking services um, on, on a college campus. And students who are just adjusting to a new social. And so, um, again, this cultural competency is ever learning. It's, it's not just a one-time thing, but we're continuing to learn about the different barriers of different cultural backgrounds that might prevent a student from seeking options or seeking services. And, and lastly, um, we wanted to talk about you, the service providers. Um, and vicarious trauma and self-care. Um, we need to be aware of our own reactions to sexual assault. We recognize that you all are here because you want to provide a service and you want to help. But it's important to also be aware of your reactions and how you're taking care of yourself. So recognize the difference between what you want and what the survivor wants. Oftentimes as we're working in this direct services, we start to see some trends and we start thinking this might be the best option for you and we forget to listen and hear, and hear out our survivors' needs and wants. And so again, just checking in with yourself, asking questions such as, is this what I want? Is this the best option for me? Or, or, or the best option I think it is for the survivor? Or is it really what the survivor needs and, the, and what they are requesting? Um, also, know and inform the survivor again of your limitations. Um, and again, we come back to that CCRT, the importance of using that community outreach as well, using your rape crisis centers, using your local um, um, domestic violence centers as well, um, connecting them to different um, community resources um, so that you are not feeling burned out as well. As, and you're not the only one who's able to provide the services, but there's others who are willing and coming to the table to help in providing services and support for survivors of sexual violence. And again, self-care, we hear it all the time. Are we applying it? Um, putting it in your calendar, hey, I need to take care of myself today. Um, or this weekend I'm gonna be, make sure that I'm doing something that's relaxing, that's stress relieving and activities, um, and doing some activities and outlets. And of course, seeking your own support circles. Um, because of um, the work that we're doing, um, again, the trauma work that we're um, dealing with on an everyday basis, um, making sure that you're seeking that support for yourself and that you're finding that um, real, real genuine support circles. And I, I wanted to take a, a, a moment. This could also be an entire webinar. Um, but we really want to bring self-care back um, to not just a spa day, but what do you do in your work that enlivens you, invigorates you? How do you relieve stress? And these same practices can really be used with someone that may have been exposed to trauma, all types of trauma. 
So I would love if you could share what you do for self-care um, on a daily basis, how you connect back with your work, and how you sustain yourself. And I think it's a great chat option because we can all share it with each other. So how do you take care of yourself um, in working on this issue, sexual assault in particular is a pretty heavy issue, and we need to be taking care of ourselves and aware of the impact of hearing people's stories have on us. I also put Joyful Heart Foundation uh, website on there. Um, taking your dog to a dog park, that's great because dogs, you can pet the dog and we know that there's all these endorphins that are released from just taking care of an other animals. So you have the double, the exercise and take care, taking care of an animal. Yoga, open communication. Yes, beginning with gratitude, celebrating successes. Jen, that's right on. We often don't celebrate successes. We've done an um, amazing job and you know, we then the next day it's just back to the grind. We don't take a moment to celebrate our successes. Yeah, yeah. Ma reading a non-trauma-related book out in the sun. I love that. Yeah. Self-care wall, going for a walk, bubble bath. I mean, I feel like all of these things, they can be everyday things. I think that's what we have to break the barrier down in our society. Like, oh, self-care is a spa day for a day, like every six months. No, no, no. We need to bring it into our, our daily work. And we need to model it for the people we work with and for the survivors we work with. We need to model how we take care of ourselves. How can we expect other people to do it if we don't do it ourselves? All right. So um, before we, I talk a little bit about these resources, I wanted to explain a little bit of what CalCASA is working towards in this space. Um, specifically, we're very interested in building the community of practice around college campuses and community-based organizations, rape crisis centers, domestic violence centers, and um, survivor voices. We're very interested in connecting you to each other. So CalCASA is you know, a voice for 84 California Rape Crisis Centers. We also have Prevent Connect, which is a wonderful resource for prevention work and has been doing a lot of work in this campus space. And we have, we, we are part of national um, initiatives and policy change and keep our, our view on advocacy and prevention policy changes in, in the federal and state level. And what we, what we heard loud and clear is that Campus advocates, whether they're campus-based or community-based, persons working with survivors that are connected with the campus want to have a, a forum for themselves. So what I would love to do, and, and, and technical assistance services, I'd love for you to think about what you want to go deeper into. What issues would you want to see for following up technical assistance around campus, sexual assault and gender-based violence, prevention and um, response. And then what we want to do is create those tools for you, as well as creating a place for you as advocates and as persons working on this issue um, to connect with each other and share resources and information. So if you want to share where, what do you need more information on? I think it would really help us figure out where to go next with this webinar series and with our technical assistance for California and beyond. We see that a lot of you may not even be in California, which is great. Um, and so how can we build this network um, nationwide? Yeah, let us know in the chat box where you would, what what um, resources you need and where you'd want more conversation. So on our website, we have guidelines for campus and we also have an intersectionality report, which is, is very, a nice way of looking at California law, Title IX and the Clery Act, how it intersects across various issues, 
like privacy and confidential communications, prevention requirements, policies on um, developing MOUs with law enforcement or with local rape crisis centers. And it gives you kind of a snapshot of what those different laws, what, where in the, in the federal and state statutes they intersect. It's hard because these things are a bit of, of a moving um, focus. And we see that new guidance comes in, like new Clery Act guidance comes in, and that impacts um, how we are looking at reporting um, for our CSAs. And so having a, a community of practice in a, a way where we can kind of look more closely at these laws and the intersections, I think will be very valuable. But at calcasa.org, we have these guidelines for California specific, but they could be adapted beyond. Also, if you're interested in the trauma work, um, the National Child Trauma Stress Network is one of the, the first to really look at trauma impacts. And what's interesting is that the work that we as advocates have known, we know trauma has a long footprint, and we know that healing and recovery is different for each person. For the work around child trauma has been some of the first and farthest reaching, and now we're seeing that it has implications throughout the lifespan and in, in adults. There's also um, there's an International Association of Chiefs of Police. What is great is they are you know, embracing this trauma-informed sexual assault investigation training. So if you're interested in more skills around a trauma-informed investigation, we're, of course, wanting us to go wider and broader into a trauma-informed system, but a trauma-informed investigation is a critical piece of that. Um, you can check that out. There's also, you have options. Um, this was started in Oregon, and it really is a way of changing the reporting options. So there's different levels of report that a survivor can choose. And again, it's an empowerment approach around survivors making choices and making their own path. So some of the things in the chat box is that Oh, focusing on small rural territories um, and starting this from scratch. Um, and um, looking at um, just kind of what uh, more resources around sex offender treatment programs. I'm actually going to be um, presenting on the containment model strategy in California later this week. So I'm hoping CalCASA can help bring people together around the sex offender treatment work that's going on and the prevention and intervention work that campuses are doing. Um, that would be a really interesting next webinar. All right, so change in the Title IX team to schools, how to motivate them to improve accommodations. That is a really big um, com connection and community building piece that we can't underscore enough. What I've seen in both, well, especially right now around campuses, is everything is compliance driven. So it's all about, you know, did I do those things the law requires? Instead of looking at it as a whole system opportunity. So that's kind of where I want to try and support you as advocates is how can we take it away from a checklist which has its value and is the lowest common denominator? How can we elevate it to having a system that is more communicative and transparent and takes advantage of the resources that it has? The other thing is um, a policy change to increase training for advocates. So that, is, that would be wonderful, Elizabeth. I'm thinking about it already. Because we need that cross-training for both RCC advocates and the campus-based advocates so they can see each other's value and their resources. Um, I think that would be incredibly um, wonderful to build that into um, our kind of ongoing TA. And it would be great to learn what has been going, worked well with the community coalitions, the CCRTs, um, and share some of the best practices. I know that here in California, there are several, several CCRTs that have had successes and we could definitely bring them on for some sort of discussion. Great. So the other thing is um, I have to, I also want to share just a few media tools. 
I know I'm a little bit late to the game, but the bear in the kitchen one is really interesting for starting a conversation and thinking about um, if it was any other thing, if it was not sexual assault, but a bear in the kitchen that was affecting one in five women, we would be doing something. It's a really interesting, thought-provoking moment, kind of like the tea consent video. When we, when we take the sexual violence out of it, it seems like it's so black and white, it's much easier to deal with. So why is that? And how can we shift the cultural norms so sexual violence is not the norm? And then just this last week, um, we, we had a bra list from MTV put out if brats were feminists which is an interesting spoof on campus and has some good talking points on that. And then the other thing is out of Australia, uh, the Who Are You Bystander video. That is a great way of bringing all levels of bystander and community into the table um, to see kind of where, what's their role and what could be their role and where is the, the intervention and bystander support and you know, how do we take care of each other in community. Right. So, I wanted to leave you with our contact information. Um, we both are working on campus-based work. Um, we have a California focus and then a national, a national view. So I think what we do in California as we try and um, push out these learnings around trauma-informed systems, that can grow to with national um, input. What would be, what is, what is nice about the trauma-informed approach, I just wanted to kind of wrap on this, is that it takes the, the bias worry um, out of it for campuses. Um, campuses are, are concerned about supporting both those, the, the complainants and the person who may have done the harm. Um, they're, they're considering both of their rights, their educational rights and um, the conduct requirements. So when we can make it be a trauma-informed approach instead of just a victim-centered approach, we really are getting back to this comprehensive strategy, right? So we're, we're saying that we recognize that those who have experienced trauma meet, need more support, but we're not taking sides. We're being open. Um, and I think campuses respond well to this kind of phrase instead of, um, even though we know it shares a lot of the tenets of a survivor-focused approach with the empowerment piece and the connection piece and the collaboration piece. All right. And then I just wanted to open it up to the chat. If any of you guys had any more questions we could answer, um, go ahead and, and ch type them in. So you know, we will be posting the recording onto the blog site on calcasa.org, and I'll send that up out in a following follow-up reminder. And then we'll also make the slides available um, if you would like. All right, thank you guys for your participation. And then and if there aren't any other questions, All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon.